It is my absolute pleasure to introduce uh, CEO Chandra Devam. Uh, she is the co-founder of a company, Iris MD, which is a high-tech mm -hmm. imaging company. And her product uh, she refers to, which I think is, is brilliant, as a Google Maps for surgeons. And it creates like precise 3D views of body organs. And mm -hmm. this allows surgeons to practice performing the surgery in virtual space, essentially giving doctors like x-ray vision. And uh, mm -hmm. it's a tremendous benefit because there's no pressure for cadavers and, uh, you know, and you can train uh, at a much lower cost and train a lot more surgeons uh, using this. So uh, Eris MD, uh, Chandra's company, has won a couple major awards, including one from NASA uh, and a competition that NASA held to find the best emerging private technology across all of North America. So it, it's my absolute pleasure to have Chandra here today. Chandra, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. So I think I'd, I'd like to start just by, if you wanna go over the technology itself. I mean, I kind of gave a brief summary, but it's hard to take Yeah, if you haven't seen it, it's hard. That was pretty good. Um, <laughs> oh, so Eris is uh, imaging software, mm -hmm. uh, to put it, in a small context. Um, so it has a lot of different applications and what you were speaking of is the one we, we speak about the most or at, at least our first one that we launched with was for surgical navigation. But then actually you can transpose those images. Um, so it's like a CT scan or an, or an X-ray or a MRI, anything, any medical imaging and diagnostic imaging that you would already have going into surgery to diagnose. We can then take that, make a map so to say, the Google Maps, um, and put it all into 3D. So it's just like if you were actually looking at the heart versus a 2D image, which is like slicing. Um, we compile it all together. Then they can pre-plan the surgery, get a really good plan on how to do it. But then during surgery, we can actually transpose that on the body so they see exactly where the heart and lungs are located because we all have different anatomical makeups. So it gives them more precision during surgery, as well as exploring and um, teaching, as you, as you put pointed out already. Yep, no, perfect. Um, mm -hmm. So one thing I'm, I'm fascinated by is, uh, you know, over the last 25 years, I've worked with mm -hmm. you know, thousands of inventors. And a lot of times they don't, their intention is not to go out there and create a new product. And, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes it's, uh, they take a really circular route to coming up with the idea. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your background, uh, where you started, and how you got down this road to uh, Google Maps for Surgeons. Well, Eris wasn't my first venture. Um, so I'd been involved with some other um, technologies that did really well in the industry. Um, my first invention was when I was eight. Uh, I, it was a school for a gifted kid, or a program for gifted kids, where they challenged us to come up with an invention that I think was called Inventor, Invention Convention or something, and I did really well with that. Um, so I was always a problem solver and, and looking at things. With Eris, um, I'd had a medical uh, treatment. Um, we'd exited from a previous startup, and I was looking for something else. Um, and so it was kind of two roads that combined really well. So I was looking for something, and at the same time, I was in Silicon Valley when Oculus was starting to, I think they'd just been purchased by, um, which, is a, uh, which is VR, like the VR headset. Most people know what it is now. Um, um, and Google Glass had just been kind of released and talked about. Um, so about so what that year, was... About what year was this to give us, like... Hmm. I'd say it was 2014 but maybe 2013, so in, in and around there. Um, and we, I said that was pretty interesting to me because I remember when virtual reality first came out and I thought that was gonna be a huge thing, but the hardware and the computers weren't there for it to display and really take off. And that was like early 90s, late 80s. Um, so that was exciting for me. At the same time, I was looking for a project that would advance people, not just like make people type faster or a better game. So I was looking for something that was a bit of a, a higher calling for me and that would help people. Um, at the same time, I had a surgical procedure that was supposed to be just day surgery, very simple surgery um, that went wrong. And my first instinct was, well, what did the doctor do wrong? 
And then I went, wait a minute, okay, well, what happened here? And they said, well, no, everybody's made up differently. And I had an artery that was in an area that they weren't expecting, um, and they hit it, and I started to bleed out and almost died (laughs) and went, hmm, how can we put all this together? So it kind of naturally emerged, well, why don't I put this, why don't I give them x-ray vision so that they know where that artery is and they can plan this going in and this doesn't happen. So that's the roundabout (laughs) story of it. Um, Wow, so that brings up a a major clarification. Mm -hmm. So this is not uh, a 3D imaging of a generic heart or the classic heart. Yeah, this is really patient specific. Yours. Yeah. yeah. So you would be the doctor yeah. would be able to practice, so to speak, the yeah. surgery on on you before he actually yes. does it. Wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that's giving me like goosebumps just thinking about that, the possibility. So I was off a little bit when I said it's it's replacing cadaver. You know, a cadaver you can only. Learn well, no, that one was really good too because we can do virtual autopsies and cadavers. No, that's absolutely true too because then doctors are able to use different patients, not just one cadaver. They can practice the surgery on different uh-huh. data sets, basically. So no, that that was actually training and school was a much was was one of my first um, applications that I wrote about. So. So, so almost like, and I'm thinking of like flight simulators where you load, mm-hmm. you know, you load like Rocky Mountains or whatever, and then you can mm-hmm. practice flying an airplane there or you load mm-hmm. the French Alps or something. So you could, uh, uh, doctors could actually choose, you know, if they want patients with certain conditions. Once you have that in their database, mm-hmm. uh, they would be able to practice on a patient with that specific condition. Well, and also like medical advances happen all the time. So you got uh, a new surgery, it's better performed this way. But a doctor would need time to say, take take time away from their practice, go and learn that. Whereas this is a way they could just download, hey, here's here's a new way to do heart surgery. Here's, you know, they used to for heart surgery, for example, was open heart and they'd crack open the sternum. Um, now they can do it with just a little tiny incision. So being right. able to bring new older doctors up to speed to the newer practices is also really important. So there's a lot of applications in medicine, but outside of medicine as well. So we, we saw a lot when writing the patents. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so tell me about, um, tell me about the patents. We haven't, none of our questions are really touched on those. So this is kind of new territory for us. So. Sure. Um, so because this wasn't our first rodeo, this wasn't our first time doing this. Um, we, uh, my, my business partner, Scott, um, his previous startup sold to Apple. So all of his patents went to Apple and now they're Apple granted patents. So we knew that the value in IP was, was incredible. Um, with startups, that startup was pre revenue when it sold and it's now like the Apple keyboard on your iPhone. Um, parts of it are at least, um, so we knew that IP was really important. So the first thing we did was file our provisional and we did a very vague, well, a large reaching provisional. So it covered not just this, but I patented the health space in AR, VR. So psychological stuff, like if you wanted to go and talk to a psychologist, but not, you know, be in their office or dealing with phobias, you know, um, chiropractic, all kinds of stuff. So we did a large pa- uh, provisional and then narrowed in claims with the patent. Um, that was really important to us. And we spent a lot gonna- of money. <laughs> So a lot of times with patenting, with uh, what inventors try is to get a portfolio of patents. So mm-hmm. situations, was that part of the strategy as well? Yeah. Or? Well, um, sometimes you get broad enough coverage with the first application that that's not. It, it's pretty, we wrote it with language that was very broad and can be narrowed down and gave a lot of different um, examples. I think our patent is for a morphological object or something. It wasn't, it wasn't specific to a live person or an animal. I thought about a veterinarian, but I, I also thought about other applications. So um, was the thought, I have to say the thought wasn't necessarily to get a large patent, you know, portfolio. It wasn't not to. Part of it was that these, these AR and VR um, um, glasses were just coming to market and I wasn't sure what was going to be possible. In fact, we started writing our software a year before we could actually test it on hard hardware applications. So we wanted to have a lot of pivot room if it was like, okay, we can't actually, I've never touched MRI data and it's not, a, we're not able to put it into 3D. So we're going to have to go with something else. So I, I gave us a lot of wiggle room with it. Um, but it's turned out to be a large patent portfolio. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, and that's that's typical. I mean, sometimes you don't yeah. know how broad the technology can be. 
uh, yeah. is, you know, initially the thoughts, of course, were, were personal related to your surgery and you thought, gosh, wouldn't this be helpful? But uh, mm -hmm. now expand it and it can tell us about some of the other areas where it possibly, whatever you can, whatever's not, whatever's already. Oh, I'm pretty, yeah, I'm pretty well versed in what not to say. So, okay. okay. All right, perfect. Good. Um, well, so interesting. We were really running with the um, the medical stuff, and it was like revolutionary because we're able to do it live, like real time. If you had your scans done, I could load it into our system, and immediately you'd be able to view it in 3D. Um, so that was really great for doctors and dentists were approaching us. Um, and then we were going to South by Southwest, which is a really big um, tech and arts conference. Actually, they've got films. They've got you know, it's a it's an interesting. If people want to go, it's a great thing to check out. There's a lot of great innovation there, but other stuff too. So we had a pitch off at South by Southwest. No, I had a book launch. That's why we were there. I was, we were launching a book with the Forbes writer in our space. I wrote the medical chapter and it was a big deal and we were excited. And there was a NASA pitch there and I was like, well, let's just check it out. Maybe there would be some applications on astronauts. Um, and we pitched and they got very excited about it and um, pointed out some applications that, so we've also got some AI in our software that uh, we were eventually going to be doing autonomous medicine where we would replace like radiologists and do robotics medicine. Like there was a whole other plan there, um, which we still probably do. So, oh, you're, sorry, my screen just blanked out. Um, so they said to us, if you can diagnose people this way, couldn't you use this on machinery that was using industrial CT? which is the same as medical CT, just larger. And we went, oh yeah, I guess we could. So we can find little cracks in airplanes and engines when you know, you've know you got um, to do a quick, rockets are very expensive. It would be good to know if there's a crack or a little screw out or something that could cause um, them to have an issue. I'm, I'm um, of the, the space shuttle Challenger, the o yeah. right? Yeah, right. yeah. It could be used for for something like that to try to see. Things. Absolutely, yes. Um, in fact, they already use industrial CT to do that. We just would streamline their process for that. Um, anytime you would need to look in, in um, and analyze if something is having issues, I mean, cars, anything. Um, so anytime you would use, so in, in the funny part is, I actually grew up in Canada in the oil patch where there's a lot of industrial pipelines and such. And I, it should have occurred to me that you could use this for pipelines and inspection of um, heavy equipment. My husband's in the industry, my father-in-law, like I, I should have saw that application and didn't. Uh, NASA said, you can use this for industrial. And we went, oh yeah, I guess we could. And luckily our patents covered that. So we can. And, um, you know, everybody had been trying to build this uh, technology in all of those industries for like 30 years and couldn't. Um, and so it was pretty exciting that we had. So we won that award. And then we actually went on to win, oh, two or three more. Um, so we were, and then the largest award that they give the public, we won. And that was really exciting and really validating for us. Um, we were you know, we're like, I think it's pretty good, but that was really, no, this is good. And we've tried to do this. So you should, this is valuable. Good job. Um, so that was exciting so and definitely a pivot, but same software. I mean, the outside validation is something that uh, is really helpful to a lot of inventors because mm -hmm. there's this hesitation. And I don't know if you face that, but uh, the feeling that you're an outsider to somebody else's industry and how dare you think that you could improve something in an industry that is not your industry? Like, was that, your industry was not, um, and we'll get into that. I mean, at one time you mm -hmm. were a real estate investor, which is pretty far from uh, doing medical work or oil refining or any of these other areas. Where or you're rockets or airplanes <laughs> or yeah, anything. Yeah. 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 Um, did I have imposter syndrome? No, but I'm maybe, I'm a pretty confident person. Um, I, I knew we'd built something really incredible. My business partner is brilliant and was a child prodigy with computers. So I knew our tech was good. I mean, he sold to Apple. He's, he's, his stuff is good. Um, did I have the industries bumping up against me? Absolutely. Saying like, well, who do you think you are? Who, and, and, a, and a girl, and, you, and I happen to look younger than I am, so I mean, often they thought I was the secretary, and just who do you think you are, and do you have a doctor, and well, yes, of course we have doctors that we've like, <laughs> gone and talked to about if this is even possible, um, but I didn't find that I felt like I didn't belong in the room. 
but I definitely at first felt the room think, well, does she belong here? And then, you know, you win everyone over when it's good technology, people are excited about it. But at first there was definitely a barrier of, well, you're not a doctor. How do you know what you're doing? Right. Who are you to disrupt our industry? And, <laughs> and then it was, funny. oh, great. Thank you for disrupting the industry. <laughs> and, and it's funny you mentioned the uh, the age, you know, and looking younger. I mean, I, you know, I'm mm -hmm. 50 now, so I don't face that <laughs> anymore. But there's a time when, uh, uh, gosh, I was, when I was initially teaching as a, as a professor at, at, mm -hmm. at, at law school, that I felt like I looked younger than most of the students. So I had to yeah. make sh absolutely sure I was the first one to class and I'd put my suit on uh, before so they would know that that's the professor and I would stand up front. And <laughs> I remember uh, complaining to my wife about that. And I said, gosh, you know, yeah. uh, uh, and she said, well, they, you know, she said she wasn't hearing any of it. And she said, well, you know, okay, so you're looking young. People might uh, uh, question whether you're the, you know, experienced, or they might question mm -hmm. whether you've got the uh, credentials, but has anyone ever questioned that you're a patent attorney? And I said, no. And she said, well, you have nothing to complain about, because my wife's a dentist. And oh, yeah. For several People years, think she's the hygienist? Yeah, the dental field yeah. has changed dramatically. I mean, now my daughters are going into dentistry, and it's, and my wife's telling them, you guys have it so much easier because uh, she would just, you know, are you the hygienist? Are you the assistant? And sometimes the entire uh, dental procedure would be over and yeah. it was like oh you know do I get to see the dentist see the dentist oh no yeah <laughs> no I would oh. get uh, people would think my business partner was the CEO and I was the secretary and be like can you get us coffee <laughs> like sure <laughs> I'll go get you coffee um, the the highlight for that though is people say things I it doesn't happen now because I've been I'm pretty public so people know who I am but when it first happened people will say things in front of a secretary they won't say in front of a CEO so we could use it to our benefit <laughs> <laughs> you get the inside scoop right before because they'd let their guard down um yeah gosh, it's, it's funny uh, and then they were embarrassed when they realized who i was and you can use that as a as a negotiation tactic a little bit and spin that to your advantage but yeah absolutely i feel for your wife there yeah so i've learned you know kind of you, you don't realize this i mean she, my wife stopped inviting me to when she had dental consultants come to her mm -hmm. office to help her with uh you know increasing productivity or business uh consultants uh, initially, she would have me come by and uh, and just kind of just be there. And then she'd stop that because she said, you know, every time you show up, you visit my office like twice a year, but these consultants speak exclusively to you. You're not a dentist. You have yeah. no idea what's going on in my practice. But, uh, but you know, I'm the one paying for these consultants and I, you know, they ignore me. And they're wasting their time talking to you. Yeah. yeah and I paid for them to be here. And, and, yeah. Her joke was, do they know that you had to, well, and this is dating myself because nobody uses MapQuest anymore because now GPS on your phone. Google Maps. Yeah. But she said, do they know you're using, that you use MapQuest to get to my office? <laughs> that that's how <laughs> uninvolved you are? Um, but uh, yeah, so that's, I, you've definitely broken a lot of, of barriers uh, mm. and, and I'm sure continue to do so. Uh, but what I'm, I'd like to go back to, and this is yep. like earlier days of uh, when you're inventing, because that's, mm -hmm. you know, now of course you've got a name for yourself and a reputation which helps, mm -hmm. but what advice would you have for an inventor who's working a nine to five job and they are trying yeah. to pursue their first idea? Is this for you? Uh, so I'd advise to work your nine to five job before, you know, um, investors, when you're doing a startup, often want you to be full time on your startup, um, which is, you know, that's a series A investor. You can get angel investors that understand that you have to get your own skin in the game. Um, I would bleed for my patents. And I said that, like, I would mortgage everything for the patents because when you, you need IP, you need something for your investors to invest in and you need to protect your, your, your idea. And one of the first questions that investors and other people, but you know, the industry will ask you is, well, what happens if you don't do this first and someone else does it? And if you have patents, you can say, well, then I have a very friendly conversation with whoever's doing it. We talk about licensing and, and some, some money that they owe me for my idea. Like it's a friendly conversation. So that's another way to, um, to protect yourself and to give value to your company because you need value to, to your company to get investment to take it to the next level. You file your provisional, that gives you time to start developing and it depends if it's a hardware or software patent. Software patents you can do 
And then working a nine to five, say you're a founder like me, who's non-technical, I'm sort of, te I'm technical, but not as technical as Scott, my, my co-founder. Um, but I can fund him to work. You can also go to like something like angels list where you can hire people for equity to work for free while you're still funding your home and whatever things you need to get off the ground. So yeah, I'd, I'd advise to patent it right away, whatever your idea. Um, don't talk to anybody about it. Uh, we were in stealth mode for a year. We didn't tell, I mean, my husband didn't even know what I was working on. I was not talking about it until it was, at least we had a proof of concept to, to show. Um, Cause it, the type of patent or the type of product I was making sounded very lofty. So I wanted to have something to show people. Um, it's not so important once you've got your provisional and you've got a date and protection. Right. Um, but be pretty broad in that. Definitely get a good patent attorney um, and use broad language so you're not narrowed because often you'll have to pivot and whittle around. So like Does that answer? <laughs> yeah, no, that absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so if you if your patents had narrowed the usage to just medical uses, that would have been. I'd be out of the rocket business. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Which is bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Which sometimes you don't, you know, you don't realize that uh, uh, at the time. So you want to protect. And the attorney, a good patent attorney is looking at, is, you know, and, and a lot of times I'm hired by companies mm -hmm. who know about a patent that exists and they're, mm -hmm. they want to find out how they can compete. Wiggle around it. Yeah. Wiggle around the patent. So yeah. when I'm working for an inventor, my goal is to put on the hat of a, uh, of a competitor yes. and try to see yeah. how can I steal this idea if I were the yeah. competitor without violating the patent. And, and yeah. then to take that a step further, like what you say, how can I be in a different industry and use this concept in a different industry without violating mm -hmm. the patent? And then you go back yeah. to things. And that's why it's, you know, it takes 12 weeks to draft the patent because you're constantly uh, looking at it or longer. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, we always, so we do an exercise, uh, even with building, um, but definitely with our patents where we say, all right, let's think of a way to do it. Now we need to sit down and think of three more way, three other ways to do it and around it. That's similar, but not the same that would have the same result and would, um, address the problem the same way and fill the void in the market the same way. So, uh, and then we patent those as well. So yeah, you definitely have to put on your hat as a competitor and how could I get around this? Like for mine, could they get around it by, I don't know, putting, um, a projector in the ceiling and projecting like physically. So we covered that, you know, and, and, you know, prior art, Sometimes somebody else has patented it and you have to go and talk to them about licensing. We didn't have that with this, but that's another, you know, situation that you're in. So. Right. Well, yeah. we had, and as an example, so our, our viewers can kind of visualize, I had mm -hmm. at, at one point I had a, an inventor whose concept was a, uh, uh, a device that attached to a water heater so that if there was a fire in the vicinity of the water heater, it would uh, uh, trigger mm -hmm. a valve and put the water mm -hmm. out. Uh, and douse the fire. Uh, the inventor was dead set on using uh, like sprinkler heads that already existed in commercial buildings that had mm. a glass bulb. And yeah. the focus was when this bulb reaches a certain temperature, it shatters and that would trigger the valve. Uh, as a patent attorney, I had to look at it and say, okay, that's one way to tell that there's a fire is temperature. But what if you, a competitor used a smoke detector to yeah. identify that there's I was just going to ask about that. Yeah, there's yeah. other ways to, to, to get there's fire, other, you know. That there's a, a fire in the vicinity, you know, oxygen sensor or whatever else, carbon dioxide. Uh, gas, other things, you know, you'd have a, yeah, exactly. And they, they hadn't thought of that? Hmm. They, no, no, they, um, yeah. Yes. It, it, and so that's why you need a good patent common. attorney to say, have you thought about it this way? And someone who really knows your space, like you need it because there's different types of patent attorneys. Like if you're doing software, don't go to, don't go to one that's dealt deal, you know, with just hardware stuff. And they're like, oh, I'm really good at figuring out how to, you know, cause often correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I know this to be true of our patent attorneys. Most patent attorneys have a previous degree in an area. So they're like an electrical engineer or they're like, you know, a software developer themselves or, or whatnot. So that's other, find the person who has a background in what you're doing. So they understand it. Yeah, exactly. And mm -hmm. at the very least uh, should be at a law firm that has, you know, pat patent law firms are kind of unusual in terms of lawyers in general that we hire yeah. of engineers and scientists, which usually mm -hmm. law firms don't have. So yeah. uh, sometimes if an invention's, spans across different industries 
you need to have a law firm that has that capability. So they might have, your idea might be software, but maybe it, it triggers something mechanical and there might be a way or a need to protect that mechanical object uh, as well. So, um, you know. Maybe you've developed um, something that has a hinge in it, that you've developed, you know, a new design for a hinge that's very, you know, you, and you need that hinge patented. Yeah, there's a lot of different, we have hardware patents too that we haven't um, pursued yet, um, but, um, and we had a different law firm handle the, the, the hardware patents, for example. And I have separate, so my, my medical business has a different law firm than my aerospace business because aerospace is a very different business than right. medicine, for example. Yeah. So having good lawyers, like, and I would not cheap out on your lawyers. That's the one place, like I said, I would bleed for my patents. That is not the place you want to save money is with a lawyer. You want to pay for somebody that's good. Same thing with like a doctor. You wouldn't go to, Hey, I know your, your wife's a dentist. Do you think she could do a nose job on me? I, I wouldn't do that, you know, or can she do a little bit of heart surgery? You want to go to somebody who's good and you you get you you get what you pay for unless your brother happens to be the best patent attorney in the world then you know even then there's a bit of a bias there that can be a problem so i would i would advise not to cheap out on your patents well and the same ever. even the best you know they say a lawyer that represents himself has is has a fool for a client because you can't be unbiased so mm. uh, and that's why surgeons are not you know they're not they might be the best surgeon in the world but if it's their mom's heart surgery Yep. They're not the best person to perform that uh, because they can't be unbiased. Um, that's right. Uh, on that. So, no, that's, that's definitely good advice. Uh, tell us about, were there any complications uh, that, <laughs> yeah, probably lots of them, as any entrepreneur has, that you ran into when you're trying to develop your idea? That hmm. I mean, just so ours was interesting because it was so lofty and it sounded like, I mean, if you look, if you ever Google me, um, it, which sounds so tacky to say, but the, one of my first um, media um, stories that they did, they called it Star Trek surgery because it sounds so bizarre and weird. It sounds like, you know, Minority Report, which it actually is similar to. Um, it, so we needed, the problem was we didn't have hardware to display what we were building. So that was tricky at first. So even when I was writing the patents, um, after the provisional, then we had to narrow on the patents, I was trying to get... Um, people's demos for their like not even on the market devices so that we could just test the software which and then these companies who are trying to get funding were like wait what what's your application that you might use our glasses on it's like oh no 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 never mind i'm just going to hope hope that this displays properly um and uh and it did luckily um and it can be used 2D on a screen now too cuz video cards are where they weren't then um but so that was a bit tricky. We were building for a year, not knowing if what we were building could actually be displayed just, you know, on, on hope and faith. Um, what else? I mean, Scott and I have a really interesting way of, so a lot of times companies will do a tremendous amount of research and market research and analytics uh, to see, is this needed? What's the market capture? Um, who's our competitors? So we do the opposite. When we're writing patents, we completely unplug from media. Um, and we didn't look at all if anybody else had done it. Um, cause I have the theory that we'll do it better. And if we can't do it better then good for them for doing it better than me. Um, kudos. Uh, so the other reason for that is with science fiction and, and definitely we stayed away. It was really hard to do that. We, we were unplugged for a couple of years while we were, and we're back to ironing out some more um, claims now. So, um, I don't want to accidentally have somebody else's idea imprinted. On, on my um, intellectual property. Um, so I wouldn't, if you'd never built a house before and never seen a house before and someone said, go build the best dwelling for you, you would build the most streamlined dwelling for you that you needed in that environment. But once you've seen a house, your diagram will always be a square, like every kid draws the same house, yep. a square with a triangle roof and a door. Um, so I didn't want to have an imprint of somebody else's ideas in within our, our, our intellectual property. And also, I didn't want to limit myself. So we're very out-of-the-box thinkers. So that is an interesting process to try and write patents in. It works for us. It's not for everybody, but it works for us. Um, within that, we didn't really run into – well, we did run into some problems with our patent uh, getting granted because the um, – 
what are they called? You know, at the patent office, the person, your reviewer. Oh, examiners, patent examiners. The examiner didn't understand what our stuff did. So we actually had to go do a like in, in person demo because they couldn't conceptualize what it was. They kept saying, oh no, I think they said we were in, in violation of like a Kodak, you know, or something like, no, you're taking pictures. We're like, no, 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 we're not taking pictures. We're displaying it. We're displaying like software. Yeah. Oh, okay, so it's like Polaroid. Nope, so we had to fly to, I, uh, rally maybe wherever it was and do an in-person demo with the guy and say here do you get it oh okay I get it now but we were running into all of these like having to it was getting actually pretty expensive like forty thousand dollars each time to have to defend no 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 this is how we're different we're not at all a camera no once again we're, we're not a film either um, so that was tricky doing something that's so out of the box and having to explain it to somebody and the reviewer is non-technical. They're just, yep. you know, at the patent office, you get who you get and you get them for the whole case. <laughs> yeah. And, and actually I ended up going to his supervisor and saying, all right, enough of this. I want you to look it over. Cause it still was, you know, didn't quite understand it. So that, that, that was a bit tricky and expensive. Um, well, and part of that is that the patent office has not adapted to software. Uh, yeah. You know, you can't, they don't want it. They want to, had the software explained in a written document with black and white drawings. So yeah, that, that <laughs> a challenge, but um, we're, we're gone a little bit over time. So what I want to sure, do, yeah. uh, make a couple announcements. Um, and if you have an interest in seeing a mechanical uh, invention, uh, next Friday, uh, the inventor of the snap it screw, uh, Nancy Tadeshi is going to be joining uh, and we'll have Q&A with her about her journey in creating an eyeglass uh, repair kit. So uh, that'll be on, um, that, that should be interesting. She's created the easiest and simplest eyeglass repair kit and we'll have a link up uh, in our Facebook channel, uh, our Facebook page, private Facebook page, The Inventor's Mastermind. And Jenny, you can post that if, uh, uh, in the chat box right now if you want. Uh, and then coming up on October, October 28th to the 30th, uh, I'll be hosting a virtual summit, a three-day summit for inventors, and we'll have lots of information coming up in the upcoming weeks about that. But um, right now, Chandra, I can't thank you enough for joining us. It's such a pleasure to have uh, an, an award-winning inventor of your caliber here that's still willing to take us back in time to when you face those initial challenges, because that hasn't changed um, you know, I'm sure the memory of that is still fresh as if it was yesterday and it's, it is, yeah, <laughs> uh, with inventors. So thank you. And, uh, thank uh, you. Uh, and for the viewers, thank you for attending this episode of, uh, ask the patent professor.